This is our second look at the integumentary system. Today we're going to focus on accessory structures. The first accessory structure of the integumentary system are nails. So both fingernails and toenails are made up of specialized epithelial cells, the same kinds of cells we talked about when we discussed skin. But these cells are very, very full of keratin, which means that they are hard, they are tough, and they are mostly dead. The more keratin, the deader the cells are. The cells begin to grow at a little space right at the um, end of the fingernail, more toward the knuckle. That little space is called the lunula, which means half moon in Italian, and it looks like a little white half moon. That's where brand new cells grow and reproduce. And then as they age, they move outward, just like the cells of the skin. From um, the surrounding area, we have this little fold of skin right where the nail comes into contact with the finger. That's called the eponychium. And that helps to create these little hardened cells that are also dead that provide extra protection for the new young cells and provide extra protection to keep the fingernail or toenail attached to the um, skin itself. That is, we often call that the cuticle, um, and it serves a protective function. The purpose of the nail in general is to protect the really sensitive ends of the fingers and toes where there are lots and lots of nerves. Um, another accessory structure that you can find in the dermis is hair. So hair covers most of the parts of the body and its primary function is for warmth. It helps to keep the body temperature where it should be. So this has a homeostasis effect. Um, some places where you will not find hair are on the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, and on the lips. Most of these structures have lots of nerves and they are primarily designed for kind of detecting what's going on in the environment. So we don't wanna block that by having a bunch of hair there. Hair grows deep inside the dermis down at this end in a place, a little pit that's called the hair follicle. Um, just like the nails and just like the skin, new cells grow here and then as they die, they move further and further from the pit itself. There's lots of blood vessels around here which help to bring nutrients and um, carry away waste. And then as the hair gets longer, it gets filled with more and more and more keratin. So by the time it breaks through the surface of the skin right here, it is completely dead. That's why it does not hurt to cut your hair. The cells are no longer alive. There's no nerve endings in the hair, so it doesn't feel any kind of sensation whatsoever. Depending on what type of melanin the body makes, you get different colors, different pigments of hair. Eumelanin is a pigment that tends to be very, very dark, so brown and black hair have high concentrations of eumelanin, whereas pheomelanin is a much lighter version of the pigment and you get more reddish, yellow, or blonde colored hair. And if there's absolutely no pigment whatsoever, which is a genetic condition, the body just doesn't make any pigment, that leads to a condition called albinism or being an albino. Okay, so a couple of accessory structures that are found near the hair. Let's say here's our little hair again, and here's the surface of the skin. Around the hair follicle, and if you scroll back to the previous slide, you'll see a picture of this. We have these structures that look sort of like that. This is called uh, the sebaceous glands. You see that right here, sebaceous glands. And the sebaceous glands make a very, very oily and slippery material called sebum. What that does is it's released from these glands and it gets carried along as the hair grows. It gets carried out with the hair and then along the surface of the skin. What that does is it makes the hair a little bit more pliable, which means kind of bendy and helps keep it from breaking off. It also keeps the hair more waterproof. And as the oil gets to the surface of the skin, it helps keep the skin waterproof as well. So the function here 
is to help retain water. Remember, that is one of the big jobs of the integumentary system is to retain water. Um, if these glands get plugged up, sometimes you get a bunch of like dirt or bacteria or other things kind of along the surface of the hair follicle and those bacteria and germs can get down into the sebaceous glands. That is what produces acne. Also alongside the hair follicle, we have a structure that looks somewhat like this. That is called the erector pili muscle. And what happens when this muscle contracts, that means the muscle gets shorter like this, it makes the hair outside the skin stand straight up instead of being kind of bent over. And what that does is it helps to trap heat along the surface of the skin. So it keeps heat here. If all the hairs in the neighborhood are standing up, it helps to trap the heat along the skin, which is what we see on the outside as goosebumps. When the hairs stand straight up and you get a little bit um, of when you tend to be cold or something. So another function, remember, of the um, integumentary system is to help retain heat to keep the body warm. Okay, kind of the opposite effect, and here you can see a picture of those structures that I was just talking about, right? Here is the uh, sebaceous gland, I'll just write SG, and this little red one over here is the e erector pili muscle. Um, so sweat glands are an accessory structure that helps to deal with cool. So again, homeostasis and keeping body temperature where it should be. If the body gets too warm, we need some way to help cool it down. So we have another accessory structure, which you can see here, looks like a little kind of coil of rope or twine. That's a sweat gland. And the gland itself produces sweat. And then when the body gets overheated, it releases that sweat out here onto the surface of the skin. So you get little droplets of sweat everywhere. Those droplets of sweat absorb body heat, and then the, it gets evaporated by the environment. So it carries both the sweat and the absorbed body heat away, which helps to lower body temperature. So sweat glands are responsible for helping to lower body temperature. There are two different kinds of sweat glands. The first one is called eccrine, and I remember this because eccrine starts with E and environment starts with E. So eccrine glands respond to changes in the environment, like exercising, for example, and it releases watery sweat that just helps to cool the body strictly. The other kind of sweat gland, which is super active in your body right now because you happen to be a teenager in the process of puberty in some way, apocrine glands are uh, responding to emotional changes. So that might be being in love, that that's a heart, that might be being nervous, that might be stress. Let's say you have to give a big presentation at school, you stand up to talk and all of a sudden you find yourself sweating like crazy. That's because that's an emotional response. And so the sweat gets released even when you're not overheated and what ends up happening is because of the release and the bacteria that's on your skin, this is extremely smelly sweat. Um, eccrine sweat almost has no smell whatsoever, but apocrine sweat is pretty stinky. Okay, so just to kind of summarize what we just talked about with body temperature regulation, it's extremely important that we keep the body temperature right around 37 degrees Celsius. Anytime you move, breathe, even just sitting while you're digesting or pumping, your heart is pumping, the body is making heat. So this is just through basic body action. That heat is good because it helps to keep your body warm, but when it gets too high, we need to get rid of it as quickly as possible. So in addition to the production of sweat for evaporation, the body, the skin will also open up the blood vessels that are in the dermis and the subcutaneous vessels. So they go from saying maybe being that size to being this size. 
and that helps to release heat into the skin and then that heat can be absorbed by sweat and then it can be released to the environment. The exact opposite happens if the body temperature gets cold, right? If it gets cold, we create goosebumps. Um, the little muscles in the skin will start to shiver and the blood vessels will go from being really, really big to really, really little to help hold heat close to the core of the body. Okay, so what are some of the things that can go wrong with the body in terms of the integumentary system? One of the big ones, obviously, since we're dealing with skin, is skin cancer. There are kind of two general types of skin cancer. This one here, cutaneous, which means on the skin, carcinoma, is the most common type of skin cancer. It's usually as a result of um, either a burn that's happened to the skin, like a, some kind of um, heat damage, for example, or just a whole bunch of exposure to sunlight over the course of a person's lifetime. So you usually find this in places that have seen a lot of sun exposure, neck, face, scalp. Um, and it is usually pretty surgically treatable, does not cause a lot of deaths. The other type, which is cutaneous, again, skin, melanoma, is a, an infection, or not an infection, pardon me, a cancer of the melanocytes in particular. So remember those cells that make pigment. Well, those cells start to divide really, really quickly, and they divide in such a way that it harms the surrounding skin. Um, so this is usually due to if you've had very severe burns throughout your life, um, like, I mean, third degree burns from something, for example, or an extremely horrible sunburn. And what can happen is instead of growing outward, if you look at the carcinoma, like this rises off the skin, that makes it easy to remove. Whereas the melanoma goes deep. Instead of coming out of the skin, it burrows inward. And if it gets to deep cells or bones or other body organs, it can be really damaging and sometimes fatal. So what happens when there are significant damages to the skin? When the skin gets damaged, what happens is, so we've got these blood vessels moving through the skin. Let's say we'll give ourselves a little piece of skin here. And you are cruising along on your skateboard and you rip open your knee, for example. And now this whole area, let's see if I can get erase right there, that whole area is wide open. So what the body is going to do is it's gonna increase blood flow here, which sounds like a bad idea, but it's actually really good because deep inside the blood vessels, we have all these little proteins that are super sticky. They act sort of like a net. So if the body increases blood flow, those little proteins can get in here and clog up this opening and block infection. When that happens, you will see a scab form. What you usually see as well is because we've got all this blood flow here, this area around the wound starts to get pretty red because blood is red, and you, it starts to get pretty swollen because blood is a liquid, so the area kind of fills up with extra fluid, and it starts to get warm because blood is warm. That process is called inflammation, and it's really good because it helps to heal the area as quickly as possible. Sometimes if there's a really big opening, a scab forming isn't good enough. There's too much space that can be damaged, and so the body will create this patch that's not exactly perfect skin, but it is a good cover, and that's what we think of as a scar. Here's a picture of kind of what that process looks like that I was just showing you. Feel free to pause and kind of take a minute to look at this. So the other type of injury, I mean, there are multiple, but another common type of injury to the integumentary system comes in the form of burns. Here are a couple of examples of burns. They are classified based on how far into the skin gets damaged. So this uh, first degree burn tends to mostly be in just in the epidermis second degree goes into the dermis. As we go along, it gets worse. You can see some of the um, causes 
four different kinds of burns like this as well as a picture here. And again, you can pause right here, write down the information. The worst of all is a third degree burn. It is called full thickness because it goes through the epidermis, through the dermis, and all the way down into the subcutaneous layer. That is extraordinarily harmful. It generally causes massive scarring. And if more than about 20% of the skin suffers from a third degree burn, it is oftentimes fatal. It's too much skin exposure. It basically opens up too much of the body tissues to infection, to a loss of water, to a loss of body temperature, and people generally have a very difficult time surviving that kind of an injury. So that wraps up our look at the accessory structures and some of the issues that can happen with the integumentary system. Here are your summary questions. Please make sure to answer each of these in your summary as well as write your own two to three discussion questions for when we meet in class. And um, finally, I'm going to show you some random facts just for your own information. See you soon.